He took off his shoes to avoid waking his wife, Kathleen, upstairs. He tiptoed quietly as he could towards the stairs leading to the upstairs bedroom, but he misjudged the bottom step. And as he caught himself by grabbing the banister, his body swung around and he planted himself heavily on his rump. A whiskey bottle in each back pocket broke, making it really very painful. Managing not to yell, though, Patton sprung up, pulled down his pants, and looked in the hall mirror to see that, it, see that his butt cheeks were bleeding. He managed to quietly find a whole box, full box of band-aids, and he began putting the band-aids as best he could on each spot he saw the butt. He then hit the now almost empty band-aid box and he shuffled and stumbled his way to bed. In the morning, Pat woke up with a searing pain in both his head and you know where, and Kathleen staring at him from across the room. She said, you were drunk again last night, weren't you? Patton said, why would you say such a mean thing? She said, well, Kathleen said, it could be the open front door. It could be the broken glass at the foot of the stairs. It could be the drop of blood trailing through the house. It could be your bloodshot eyes. But mostly, it's all those band-aids stuck on the hall mirror. <laughs> of Monty Python and the Holy Grail. And it was when the yellow fever was going in Europe and people were dying by the thousands. And the undertaker would come in his cart pulled by the horse and he would cry out, bring out your dead. And then they would come out, bring out your dead as they came by. People would come and throw the dead bodies on the cart. They had to give the undertaker five pence and uh, then, of course, he kept on going down the street, bring out your dead. Now, a man carrying a lifeless body out to the cart, as the undertaker came by, bring out your dead, he started to put him on the cart, and the man cried out, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> now, I believe, folks, that we are living in the last days. And I want you to just turn to your neighbor and say, are you dead yet? <laughs> dead. We are the folks, we are the silent, but we are the majority of people. But I want you to know the world says to you that you're dead. Now, every time I say bring out your dead, I want you to respond back, but I'm not dead yet, all right? Bring out your dead. I'm not dead yet. Good. We don't even have to do that twice. <laughs> In the last days, folks, I tell you, the scripture says our hearts will fail us, and I believe we are living in those days. All you have to do is listen to your 6 o'clock news in the evening. The liberal media would tell you we are dead. There are terrorists on every hand, and I tell you, you can, you can attack our American embassy, and no one does anything about it. We are open game. Our children are afraid to go to school because they'll be shot. You can't go to a theater and a mad gunman come about. Even shopping malls are not a place, safe place to go anymore. There are no restraints on we who are Christians. And even we don't trust our government, folks. What went on for the last few days? We don't trust our government. I love this give you a little laugh. Hostess bakery plant shut down but for the worker strike, but maybe you don't know how it was split up. The State Department hired all the Twinkies. <laughs> the Secret Service hired all the Ho-Hos. <laughs> the generals are sleeping with the cupcakes. <laughs> and the voters sent all the ding-dongs to Congress. <laughs> are living in 2013, everyone did what was right in their own eyes. 
In the 50s, many of us didn't even lock our doors. We didn't even know where the key was. But I tell you what, we are open game. We Christians are the only ones, folks, that you can persecute and get by with it. You can persecute Islam, you would be jailed immediately. You think what happened to poor Paula Dean. We're the only group, folks, that are being persecuted. If you've got an email to, to um, Tortured for Christ, and, and actually this absolutely all over the world, Christians are held, and we're doing nothing about it. And I'm telling you, the card is coming. Bring out your dead. And that is what this day is all about. We're not dead yet, and you've come today to be encouraged. We have prayed for each one of you by name, and we want you to know this is what the dead, this is what it's all about. You are not dead. And we want whatever you brought today to leave it at the foot of the cross. Write out your prayer request. Love and I pray for them earnestly. And I'm telling you, the world may shout, bring out your dead. I have to tell you a funny, I was studying on this message. I was in Pennsylvania this past weekend, and I, I have been for three days. I was coming home, and I had to make a plane change in Detroit, and my plane was late, and I had to, well, I couldn't run, but I did as fast as I could, and they were already loading. I got on, I sat down, then I had seated by a, a Hindu, and um, that was another story. But anyway, I was studying this message. When I got off the plane in Indianapolis, I know I looked bad. And uh, when I got off, here was a lady with a wheelchair, and she said, honey, here's your wheelchair. And I said, but I'm not dead yet. <laughs> Our scripture today is 1732, taken from Luke. And it's a very short scripture. It's actually three words. It just says, remember Lot's wife. Let's pray. Father, we come praising you for who you are. And the world cries out to us that we're dead. But we've come today to be encouraged and go back into the world out there and let them know, Father, we're not dead. We've come today to get our marching orders from you. And the cart may just pass us by because we're yours. And Father, I know Satan is making an all-out effort on Christians because he knows his days are numbered. And Father, we've come today to say we are yours, Father. And we ask you to meet us at the point of our need, our brokenness, our dreams, our, our bad news, children, Father, breaking our hearts, uh, losing loved ones, whatever the need, speak to us today, Father. May you translate every word and song and action today to meet those needs. Thank you, Father, that we're not dead because you're counting on us. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Luke 17, 32 is a story of Lot's wife. We all know the story. And Jesus actually says these words. He's the one that says to us, remember Lot's wife. Wife. Why didn't he say, why don't you remember Sarah? I'm doing Sarah this afternoon. Why didn't he say, you remember Ruth or Esther or Rahab? But instead he said, remember Lot's wife. Now, folks, did she have a name? Well, of course she had a name. I'm going to name her pretty soon. But I want you to know she had a name because in the word in Psalms 139, it says, he knew your name before the foundation of of the earth. Isaiah 49 says your name is inscribed on the palm of his hand. Of course he knew her name. Now I really think the reason he used Lot's wife and not her name was because Lot was partially to blame in this situation. And uh, for the last three months I've lived, I've eaten, I've breathed, I've, I've well I've even slept. Uh, sometimes on Genesis 13 19 because love assigned me to do Sarah now I'll be very honest with you I studied Sarah years ago and I didn't like her and so I didn't give her and I ended up giving Hagar instead because 
because I just really didn't like her. And then the Lord revealed to me while I was studying her, hey, Betty, he always uses my name. He said, hey, Betty, if everybody knew everything about you, they wouldn't like you either. <laughs> and that's what the Word gives us, folks. And uh, I really gave her a bone steer because she is the first woman mentioned uh, in Hebrews 11. She's mentioned for her faith. She's the first woman uh, listed. Now, um, the setting for this, you all know the scripture, is saying is setting of the second coming. When Jesus mentioned, he said it'd be like the days of Noah. Then he says it will be like the days of Lot. And it says it will be the same in the days of Lot. People will be eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed. Now Jesus, a man of full of compassion and mercy, he even prayed for those that were on the cross to forgive them. But I tell you folks, he is also a consuming fire. And he is a God who is a God of justice. And when he says, I'm coming again, he will fulfill that promise. Years ago, Jonathan Edwards, a preacher of yesteryear, used to preach a sermon, they said, that was entitled, It will be an awful thing to fall in the hands of an angry God. And it said that people in those days would actually run down the aisle to accept the Lord Jesus. Brian Jones, a friend of mine, has written a book called Hell is Real. You need to get it. And then it says under there, I don't like to think about it. But folks, this is directed to us because Jesus is not talking to the Pharisees. He is talking to his disciples, so he's talking to us. Now, I want to name Lot's wife. I think her name was Lottie, don't you? <laughs> really, historians say, as I studied, that, that probably her name was Edith. But she lived in a time when there was no churches, there was no ministers, there, there was no Bible. And the knowledge of God only came to one man. And as I studied this, it's interesting that God had been silent for 400 years before he spoke to Abram. From the time of Noah, no one had heard. Of course, they had passed it down for 10 generations. But you, we all know the story, folks, and it, of course, Noah, Noah was a man of the flood, but then God was silent, and compared to millions, here was Lot, Lottie, she was the wife of Lot, he was the nephew of Abram, and he was like a son to them. And she was a very favored woman. Second Peter 2.7 says that Lot was a righteous man. Now, they lived in the Ur of the Chaldees, which, by the way, would be our Iraq. They were nomads. They traveled from place to place. God said, you get out here, you go from place to place. Lot went with him. Lot was very rich as well, as well as Abram. They had all kind of flocks. Now, their herdsmen got into a fight. They said, your sheep are eating too much grass. This is Lot. Abram, no, they're not. They got into a fight. And uh, Abram said, no, 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 now we're family. Let, let's not get into a fight here. He said, Lot, you take whatever you want. You look one way, I'll go one way, you go the other. Now, Lot looked down at the lush, verdant valley of the Jordan Valley, and he saw all the green grass, and he said, I think I'll go that way. Now, folks, I know Lottie had a lot to do with it, because every one of you women, don't tell him, but you have an influence on the decisions he makes. And, uh, you know, every good idea your husband ever had, you gave him. Just don't tell him that. <laughs> now, this was her reasoning. She would say, well, I have daughters. And, uh, you know, they need to be exposed to the culture. And, and um, uh, they, they need to marry some rich merchant. So let's go towards Sodom. Now, I don't need to explain Sodom to you. You all know what that means. And I think she was saying, you know, I don't want them to marry these smelly sheep herders. I want them to, to marry. Let's go down 
toward Sodom. It's interesting, Genesis 13, 12 says they pitched their tent near Sodom. By the 14th chapter, they're living in the city. Now, like Lottie Lot had traded her tent for a penthouse, folks, and she liked to go to Ruth Chris's steakhouse every night because she could. <laughs> she had plenty of money. And her husband was a big, important boy. He sat at the city gates. Oh, yeah. I mean, she had money, she had status, she had prestige. And I think also she liked to go to the Sodom Mall. But Genesis 18.20 says God himself came down. It's the only time in the scripture where the, the wickedness of a city and God himself came down. And he had heard about what was going on in the city. Now, there are two angels that have come. Now, they're as men. No one knows they're angels. And he said to um, Abram, I'm going to destroy Sodom. Because God has come down and he's seen the wickedness that is very grievous, the scripture says. And Abram said, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Now. Whoa, 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 whoa. If I can find 50, would you spare? Yeah, God said. Uh, he goes by fives. 45? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, 40? Yeah, I'll still spare. Then he, he leaves off to five and goes to 10. And then he said 30, 20, 10, and finally God's patience is exhausted. He said, if you can find 10, I'll spare the city. And finally they can't find 10. He said, well, my nephew Lot lives there. Would you spare he and his family? And he said, yes, I will. Now, we know as the two men who were angels, they're just men, they approached the gate. Lot is sitting at the city. He said, oh, well, come home with me. They said, no, no, no. We'll just stay in the the town square. Oh, well, uh, Lot said, no, you can't do that. Now, that was the custom of that day. No, you come home with me. Now, it tells us that Lot uh, actually cooked for him. I don't know where, I think maybe Lottie was down having her nails done. I don't know. <laughs> Lot feeds them, and then the scripture says, both young and old and rich and poor, perverted men, they come to Lot's house and they said, they don't mess any words, said, we'd just like to visit with you. They said, bring those two men out that we want to molest them. That's how wicked Sodom was. And Lot goes out, and I don't like the reason I think it was Lot that it's mentioned instead of just her name, because Lot offers his two unmarried daughters. They said they've never known a man. Can you imagine? And they said, we don't want them. And they're going to kill Lot himself. And the angels actually blind all of the men. And, of course, they grab Lot. They bring him back in before they tear down the door. And it says Lot lingered because he wanted to go to his son-in-law's. He had more than two daughters. These two were unmarried and never known a man. He goes to his son-in-law. Maybe he had grandchildren. I don't know. And he goes and they laugh at him. They said, oh, you've got to be kidding. You're a crazy old man. And Lot said, they're going to destroy the city. The next morning, the two angels, men of God, take Lot and his wife and the two unmarried daughters, and he gave, gives them two commands. Don't stay on the plains and don't look back. Now, when, why did he say, don't look back? I don't know, but God said it, folks. God said it. And it says, as they, as, as they were leaving the city, that Lottie lingered behind. Now, there are three things I want to tell you today. There are three things that I want to mention from this story. Number one, that the world says to you that you are dead. They say that you are dead. You know what? We as Christians have got to be careful, number one, for possessions. Uh, possessions aren't wrong. They had money. They had servants. They had, Lottie had furnishings of her home, and she had a, a husband that sat at the gates. And she had designer clothes and the finest of foods. And the world would say she has it all. I love Cory Ten Boone that I do. And Cory Ten Boone said in her delightful Dutch accent, I love your cutlery. 
but you have too much. Do you know what the biggest business in America is today? It's the storage bins. It is. That's the biggest business in America. It's the possessions that we think we have to have. Have you ever watched Hoarders on TV? And, and it's not wrong to give your children what you didn't have. And there's nothing wrong with possessions because Abram and Lot were very rich and they had everyone to wait on them. 1 Timothy 6.17 says, Do not put your hope in wealth, but put your hope in God who richly provides. I love the message paraphrase Bible. In 1 John 2, it keeps saying, have nothing to do with wanting, 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 wanting. He mentions it. It says, you've got to want what God wants for you, folks. Wealth and house and social status will be nothing but, but leave you empty. I love the old story about the mother who took her little daughter down to the corner drugstore. They got what they wanted and then they saw the scales. You used to actually be able, I can remember, you put a penny in and you could weigh yourself. Little girl wanted to weigh herself and so she stepped on, weighed herself. The mother decided she'd weigh herself and she weighed herself and there was a heavy set lady getting ready to, to get on the scales. And the little girl was all big eyes and she put her penny in and the, the dial went psh, 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 psh. Went around three times and it landed on three pounds. And the little girl said, Mommy, look, she's hollow. So, <laughs> folks, I tell you, if we trust in possessions, I want you to know that it's important to you. Second coming, remember Moth's wife. And the wagon is coming and calls out, Bring out your dead. <laughs> second thing, not only possessions, the second thing is purity, folks. We live in a generation that is obsessed with sex and sexual perversions. We live with sin so long it is no big deal. My parents would absolutely not believe what has happened to the morals in America. And even I can't believe in the time of my lifetime what has happened. You see now, the world tells you homosexuality is no big deal. They don't tell you on the sitcoms and on the reality shows that um, homosexuality is all right. They don't have to. All they picture to you is that homosexuality is normal. And that's what your children are growing up with, folks. And you make sure of what they watch. Um, we live in a land that same-sex marriage are being legalized and it's coming to us. We have ladies here from seven states. One of your states may have already legalized same-sex marriage. Abortions are no big deal. I can remember when they first legalized abortions, I was invited all over the country to give lectures in our secular colleges on abortion. I'm not invited anymore. You know why? Because it's become accepted. We are being conditioned to the darkness. My book is for sale out on the table. I just want to read you a story um, from my book. My husband was in charge of the Florida State Youth Convention. He wanted to invite an outstanding featured speaker. After much prayer and searching, he invited Sketch Aronson, a Christian artist, to speak. I will never forget the following story Mr. Aronson told from the platform. He told the audience that he was celebrating his 25th wedding anniversary and he wanted to make the celebration very special. Several people recommended him to take his wife to this restaurant. The food was excellent, a violinist came to the table, played your favorite song, be expensive, but for the 25th anniversary he made the reservations. And when the evening arrived they were escorted to their table. He said it was everything he had hoped for including the dimly lit candles that established a romantic setting. When the waiters handed Mr. Aronson the menu, he had to strain to see the menu because of the dim lights. The waitress saw him straining and she said, Mr. Aronson, if you'll wait just a few moments, your eyes will be conditioned to the darkness. He used this story to illustrate to the young people, we live in a world where we are little by little being conditioned to the darkness. And that's exactly what's happening to us. Why is it any big deal of abortions and 
homosexuality because God said so, folks. It was interesting in the study of Sarah. I found this from Ezekiel 16, 49 and 50. I want you to look at this. I never knew that before. I thought God destroyed Sodom just because of its homosexuality. That was part of it. But look at this. Now this was the sin of our sister Sodom and her daughters were arrogant. They were overfed, unconcerned. They did not help the poor and needy. They were haughty and did detestable things, that's homosexuality, before me. Therefore, I did away with them as you have seen. <coughs> Are we? Are we overfed and unconditioned? Do we care about the poor and the needy? God came down. What if he came down to America? What would he say about us, folks? You are God's chosen. And as I said, that's what this day is all about. Keep yourself from the world. Don't be conditioned to the darkness little by little. I have to even look at myself and what has happened in my lifetime. I actually walked out of Dr. Zhivago years ago because he had a mistress. Would I do it today? I, I just I want to get down to where we are. I teach every year at Johnson University for their senior saints. Any senior saints here that, was, that, that, that goes to Johnson uh, every year? And by the way, all the jewelry out there is for the pedigree scholarship for Johnson University. And there is a bargain today. You buy two, you get one free all across the table. <laughs> but I want to tell you what this lady, I, my message uh, for senior saints was we are in the end times. And um, a lovely lady, she Christian lady, I've known her for years. She actually is a mother-in-law of one of the professors, came up to me and she said, Betty, I want to tell you a story. She said, a friend of mine, Christian friend, we love The Bachelor and The Bachelorette. And she said, in fact, we always get together whenever it's on. And what we do, we take a piece of paper and we write down who we think is going to be eliminated. And she said, it's just a wonderful, wonderful thing we do together. And then she said, while it was the bachelorette was on, I had gone to visit out of town my um, daughter and son-in-law. And she said, oh, it's pretty soon we've got to watch the bachelorette. And my son-in-law said to me, mother, if you want to watch the bachelor and the bachelorette, you go into the bedroom. Because I do not want my two sons exposed because it's making a mockery of love. Well, that's where we are. You see, the sitcoms that we let our children watch, they weren't raised with the same morals you were. And folks, I am so tired of the world taking, taking animals that have more rights than the unborn baby. I love what President, I love what President Ronald Reagan said. I notice those who are for abortion are already born. <laughs> you see, do you know why our children have no concern for life now? You know why people, they need to ask me. But anyway, do you, no, seriously, you think about this. You know why our young people are unconcerned with life? It's because we abort babies. And you watch it, it won't be in my lifetime, folks, but it's going to be in many of your lifetime. We're going to have euthanasia. We are. We're headed there right now. We are headed there. And that's why, you know, if you can kill babies, 500,000 a year, then Planned Parenthood, Father. I remember pres our president said, God bless Planned Parenthood, and I don't want to throw up. Amen. Folks, listen. If you lay down with the dogs, you're going to get fleas. <laughs> Proverbs 14, 12 says that the way seemeth right unto man, but the end thereof is the end of death. And Lottie Lot says she <laughs> followed behind. The angels had taken them out and left them. And Lottie Lot lingered behind. And uh, she longed for her old days. She looked back. Do you know what happened to her? 
Folks, when I saw the reruns, I didn't watch it, of Miley Cyrus and the Music Awards, I absolutely wept. It reminded me of what Moses found when he came down from the mountain. And he found the people who were doing sexual acts. It was the most disgusting thing I have ever seen. Folks were there, and the cart is coming, and they're calling out to you Christians, bring out your dead! No, we're not, because he is coming again. The last one, not only for possessions and purity, but God has made a promise, and he said, I'm coming. And, and God says, I am going to come. Revelation 22, behold, I am coming soon. Blessed is he who keeps the words of this book. He came first as a lamb, but he's going to come as a lion, folks. Why did God say for her not to look back? I don't know. But all I know is he said, don't look back. And maybe she had uh, grandchildren. Uh, we're not told, but we know she had some of all, so she had married daughters. And folks, ready or not, Jesus said, I'm coming back for you. That is my promise. And you have to make a daily choice, folks what you're going to do with his promise that he's made because you are not dead yet. There is a book called The Harbinger. I hope you have read it. It is by Rabbi Jonathan Kahn. And I heard him just the other day. And he spoke and he said, do you know all of the terrorist attacks and all of the things that happened to America actually fell on a Jewish holy day. And I checked him out from, from Oklahoma City to 9-11. Folks, God is at work. My husband used to keep a sign on his door. And I always loved it because when you opened the door, it said, perhaps today. He may come today. Folks, it's the same. The scripture says it in Luke 17, they were eating and drinking and buying and selling and planting and building when they left Sodom. But God rained down fire from heaven. You see, the girls were a reflection also of their mother because they actually got their father drunk and they both lay with him. And they produced the Ammonites and the Moabites. And if you know your word, they were enemies of God. Keep your eye on the goal, folks. Keep your eye. And I want you to know today that God keeps his promise. Folks, don't forget it. Don't be interwoven with the world because the cart is coming. And I love Rambo's song, and we shall behold him. He's coming again. Today, by the western shore of the Dead Sea, stands a pillar of salt known as Lot's wife. It's a monument to the perpetual reminder of me and of you that a woman was allowed to let her human nature take over her possessions and her purity of life. She may have stayed here, but she stayed with the world, folks, and she longed for it. Our Lord is coming. And I pray today that you will take a new vow and say, I am going to serve the Lord. This world is not your home. You're just a passing through. And the card is coming and the world says to the Christians, bring out your dead. <laughs> Corey Ten Boone said this, and I love Corey. When a train goes through the tunnel and it gets dark, do we jump out? Well, of course not. We just sit still and we rest and trust the engineer to bring us through. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I know there are needs today and it's dark. Father, they're sitting in that tunnel. But I just pray that today will be an encouragement that they just sit still. And Father, so through that dark tunnel right now that they'll just trust you because you're going to get them through. May each one of us sense your presence today. Our wounds are deep. Our disappointments are heavy. But, Father, we're not going to get on that card. And we're not going to give up. And, Father, we're not even going to play dead. It's time now, Father, for us to not jump out because we trust you. And because you live, I can face tomorrow. I can face tomorrow. Heavenly Father, thank you. 
Thank you for this day. Thank you, Father, of our possessions that are not going to possess us. We're going to keep our lives pure because you said again, I am coming, and we believe your promise as in the days of war. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.